Landed on the Substance. I'm your host, Philip Marinello, here with Trevor Aiken. Hey. And Vincent Edwards. What's going on? Thanks for coming back, everybody. And today we have a special guest with us. We have Diane Jago, a relatively freshly uh, published author. Diane Jago, how are you, Diane? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So where are you living at now, Diane? So um, we are living in Pensacola, Florida. It's me, my husband, and my three kids. Okay, so back in Pensacola. Are you originally from Pensacola? No, I'm from Wisconsin. um, And when I married my husband, Ethan, he was in the military at the time. And so we've been all over the place. Um, Yeah, West Coast, East Coast. And so Lord willing, we're here for good. (laughs) Oh, wow, neat. Excellent. Okay, so uh, we, I don't even remember. It's probably been like, 10 years or so since we've actually personally talked and interacted. So for the listeners, I Trevor and Vince know, for the listeners, uh, Diane and I went to college together for a little while. Yeah, I was there 2008, 2009 in Clearwater. Enjoying the sunshine state. Yeah, I feel like I've always been destined to, <laughs> to live in Florida. I just love it here. So you ended up getting married and then becoming a military wife. And did you guys move right away? Yeah, so he was stationed in Washington State. I lived there for a year. Um, We moved to California, lived there for almost four years. And then we were in Georgia for a year, Pennsylvania for, I guess, over three years. And and we just, we've been in Pensacola one year. All right. So for for the listeners who may not be familiar with you and your story, I know there's a couple of different things we want to talk about. want to definitely talk about the book a little bit, talk about the magazine and just your journey. Why don't you give us um, a little bit? How, how do you introduce yourself? When someone says, hey, Diane, like, tell me about yourself. What do you usually say? Um, I usually say I am a stay-at-home mom, but I run a business out of my home, which is called Deeply Rooted Magazine. And it's an annual publication that's all about glorifying God in womanhood. And as you mentioned early, earlier, um, I've released a book in March, which is called A Holy Pursuit, How the Gospel Frees Us to Follow and Lay Down Our Dreams. My husband, Ethan, um, he was in the military for 13 years, and so he recently accepted a position to be as the director of college at our local church here in Pensacola. So now I feel like I'm transitioning from military wife to pastor's wife, so um, just serving alongside him in college ministry. Oh, excellent. He's going to be the cool. college pastor out there? Yeah, yeah. That's Wonderful. Cool. It's wild to me. Every now and then when I hear numbers like that, you said he's been in the military for 13 years? Yeah. That we're in like this stage of life now, like we're still young. I still think of myself as like a young person (laughs) that we can talk about things we've been actively involved in personally and professionally with with those types of numbers. Like that's just (laughs) kind of mind boggling. Yeah. 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 I feel like that's what old people say. <laughs> yeah. know, we, <laughs> we're in the next stage of old. Shout out to old people. Yeah, us. <laughs> I feel the same way. Today my kids had um, their like orientation, and I have a fourth grader, so I'm just like, that's crazy Whoa. for me. Yeah. yeah. Wow. A fourth grader. So they did orientation, you said, recently? Yeah. Yeah, for school. Has it been logistically challenging for you guys with everything going on? Um, so, like, the end of the school year last year was, de- was like, online learning, but we chose the traditional route for school this year. So we'll see how it goes. They have new policies. It's a lot different. But it might be kind of a dance between school, in school, out of school, virtual learning. So I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of people are having to flex those flexibility muscles. Yeah, definitely. No, a super challenging time. I'm my little guy is only two years old, so I'm I'm grateful to not have to deal with. They're almost two years old. I'm glad I don't have to deal with the school thing right now. But that is that's just wild right now. Yeah, yeah. sure. One thing I noticed was your book launched kind of at the beginning of all of all this thing, right? It did. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. And what's so funny is like throughout the book, I talk about God's sovereignty and like his perfect timing. And so as like we're gearing up to launch and everything is shut down, like Amazon's not selling books. I just really had to um, put into practice the things that I'd written about because God is in control. And it, even though it can feel untimely to launch a book during a global pandemic, it really um, the message is definitely timely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That 
I, I can definitely see there being kind of a having to counsel your own soul, physician heal thyself kind of thing when when that yeah. goes down. What was that experience like? Was there was there benefits in light of that? Do you think that there's been any has an impact of it been negative or positive or hard to tell? Yeah, it's hard to tell just because it's it, I guess it's not even six months old right now. Um, but from what I've gathered, I mean, people, especially when things were shut down, they're reading more. And so the thing that I will never regret is the main emphasis being on the gospel. And that's applicable at all times, for, for all time. And so um, even though it, yeah, it was unideal in the sense that things were shut down and people couldn't physically go to the store to buy it, like they still could buy it from different websites and whatnot. And so yeah, just had to trust God throughout that process. Yeah. So how long, I mean, we want to talk a little bit about the book. There's a couple other things we want to talk about as well, especially the magazine. But tell us a little bit about how the book became to be. Um, so about, I guess it was in 2018, um, I had an opportunity to submit a book proposal. And the topic that um, I kind of landed on was just a message that I had seen a lot in our culture at that time was just these, especially directed towards women, like follow your heart, chase after your dreams. Um, if you're not doing something that gives you purpose, then are you really like making the most out of your life? And so I was really tired of seeing that even within Christian circles. And so um, just my own personal experience of starting up a Christian women's magazine prior to that, um, my pursuit that I thought, especially um, early on in my entrepreneurial journey, I thought I was going to be a wedding photographer, and my heart was so set on that. And God redirected those steps and took me on a different course. Never, I never imagined that I would create a Christian magazine, never imagined that I would end up writing a book. And yet, I, that kind of that time thing, I can look back, you know, six years ago when I started the magazine um, and see, wow, this God had a totally different plan for me. And so when we really just um, submit like we, when we become a Christian, we're essentially giving, handing our lives over to him saying, it's not my will, but your will. And when we do that, there's freedom. We don't have to be chasing after dreams endlessly. And yet at the same time, we can chase after dreams for the glory of God. So I wanted to to give uh, my audience a message that basically said, there's not a one size fits all plan when it comes to dream chasing. But at the end of the day, what matters most is loving the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Very much so. I, I have a specific, I do, I would definitely like to talk about Deeply Rooted for a little while, but I love the subtitle, How the Gospel Frees Us to Follow and Lay Down Our Dreams. Did you come up with that? Did they come up with that? How did that, how'd you guys land on that? Yeah, I came up with it, but what I was struggling with was whether it should be How the Gospel Frees Us to Follow or Lay Down Our Dreams, but then it was one of um, our editors from the Deeply Rooted magazine, and she was like, no, I think it should be and. And so it was definitely, um, I think, a team effort with that. But just the, yeah, again, going back to the fact that it's not a one-size-fits-all plan, um, there have been times in my life where I've had to lay down dreams. There have been times where I've followed them. There have been times where I've pressed pause on them. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of the, the just behind that title. Well, I mean, shout out to her. I... As a 30-something-year-old male and probably not the uh, the primary target audience of this book, but <laughs> if I was looking for something for my wife or for friends or even like if I was just browsing, like that subtitle, even if I didn't know you, I think would at least catch my eye and make me pick it up and check it out. That's awesome. <laughs> so you said Deeply Rooted was kind of your... Uh, way into this because you already had a bit of a publishing background that's been around for six years already you said yeah so wow. we started that through a crowdfunding campaign and basically my my heart was burdened because a lot of the things that i come across in women's ministry were either really um, emotions based experience based or just really shallow and at the time i guess when i launched the campaign i was involved in our local church our, the women were actually going through wayne grudem's systematic theology book and Excellent. that was a life-changing um, study for me just because um, I hadn't really, like in a lot of the women's ministries that I've been to, just moving around in the military, like we didn't get into that kind of depth. And so um, my heart in starting the magazine was, man, if we could get women to be attracted to something that's visually appealing, because there's, there were plenty of like, I don't think most women would pick up the systematic theology book. It's just people do judge a book by <laughs> no, the cover. That's understandable. No, that's true. And I mean, frankly, like people, most people won't just do that. 
Yeah, yeah, that's true. And I, to me, Pinterest is proof that women are visual creatures. They're they're drawn in by imagery and design. And so what if we could make a product that was visually appealing but also was was matched in substance with, with that kind of depth, um, pointing people to the word, pointing people to the gospel, getting them to think about um, various doctrines. And so that's how the idea for the magazine was birthed, was just how can we take some of these deeper truths and apply it to the everyday, like being a mom, um, keeping a home, um, you know, just women's topics. So Sure. No, I mean, I, I remember when – you were talking about getting the deeply rooted like game plan together and running the Kickstarter and then the success. And I just thought that was a really cool thing that you were just kind of going for it just personally. And maybe even from like a bit of the whole worldly, like, Oh, like she's doing it. She's following her dreams. And like, it seems to be successful. That's cool. What was that like personally? Cause you were married at the time. Did you have, you had children cause that was six years ago. You said, right. Yeah. Yeah. I had, um, I had two kids at the time. Um, and, my husband was working like a job that was, had a lot of long hours. So I would work a lot during nap times and evenings when, when he was gone. But it was basically, I wasn't sure, do people want this? I don't know if the Lord wants me to do this. And so we set it to be a 30 day all or nothing campaign. So basically if we didn't raise the money required, um, anyone that had donated would get their money back. And so this was kind of my big, like, Lord, if you want this to happen, like, please allow us to meet our, um, needs, but if not, like just slam that door shut and make it very clear. But um, I think it was by, I don't know, the day 21 or something around there, um, we reached well over what we needed. Very nice. And for people who are not familiar with the magazine as much, like even myself, what is your role and how does that, do you have other people kind of contributing in and you're editing or what? what's your role with that? Yeah, so I manage basically everyone on the team. So we have... Um, each issue, there's probably 50 to 60 people that collaborate with us. We have um, authors and artists and um, pastors who oversee the content. And so I'll pick a theme for the issue. Um, this last issue that we did is called Disciple. And um, I'll assign articles so people write it. And then the art that goes along with it, I'll work with our creative director to, to, to match those things together. And then we put that through a biblical content review. There's three men that review the content just to make sure that it's sound and lines up with our statement of faith. And then um, I deal with the printer. So I'm just, I guess I manage everything. I, my title's founder, so. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, that's exact. That's kind of cool to hear that there's a bit of like a, a theological review, not just, oh, we like this person and they wrote a thing that sounds good. Like that's encouraging, especially in the realm of women's ministry that you're taking great pains to not just either tell women what they want to hear or just mm -hmm. sell them a nice looking coffee table book, but you want to actually minister to their hearts. Yeah, I agree. And I think our biggest thing is like our ministry is never, it's, it's a parachurch ministry. Our goal also is just to point women to the local church and to show them that that matters. And so that's been our heart behind all of it. We don't want the magazine to, re to replace your scripture reading, and we definitely don't want our ministry to replace um, your local church. So if we can be a help to point people to those things, then that's awesome too. Nice. So um, just getting to maybe some of the things in the book, you, you mentioned a lot in there about social media and I know you've talked even here about Pinterest and, and there's Instagram and there's all this stuff. We're just inundated with it all the time, right? And yeah. so I was I was just kind of picking up on, as you're talking about that, you probably thought deeply on that issue. And so I, I wanted to hear your perspective on in this social media soaked world, how does a dreamer guard against temptations to vanity? Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a tough question. It's, it's definitely hard because I do believe that social media is set up to promote self. Um, we have like platforms named YouTube, which is an obvious one. Um, I think the biggest way that we can guard our hearts first and foremost is to just um, be in the word every single day to have an active relationship with God. As we read through scripture, it's like a mirror looking at us. It's living, it's active. Um, and it, it <laughs> we ask God to search our hearts and to help us sift through our intentions. And so the Holy Spirit plays a huge part in our social media habits. Um, it's not something that's often said in culture. Um, it probably sounds crazy, but the reality is we, like for me personally, when I'm posting on Instagram before I 
publish something, I have to think about why am I posting this? What is my motive behind this? Even if it's something that's ministry related, I could be talking about God and yet I could be trying to give myself glory in that. And so um, I think we have to really consider our motives as we post. Um, we have to just pay attention to who it is that we're following, what we're consuming, even if we don't agree with a lot of the things that we're taking, that we're reading online. We're taking an information, and that information just adds up and adds up, and it can condition our minds. If we're spending more time on Facebook and reading articles than we are spending time in the Word and considering things that are righteous and true, um, that's going to really shift our our perception of life. It's going to change um I don't know, it's just going to affect us in so many different ways. And so in one of my chapters, I just talk about um, what, like, some of the things that the world says um, and kind of unpacking, like, the root behind those things. So, like, when they say, um, follow your heart, really, what is it? what is it that they mean? They might be promising happiness on the other side of following our heart, but we know that scripture says that the heart is desperately wicked. And so um, we really just have to be cautious as we navigate social media, recognizing that a lot of the messages have worldviews behind them that are almost all of the time con- contradictory to scripture. Now, thankfully, there's plenty of awesome Christians on social media out there, and so we can be following some really great people Um, But then at the same time, we also have to caution ourselves not to be consuming all of their material and letting that be a substitute for our quiet time with God. So there's just so many ways for us to um, fall into a trap of of vanity, fall into a trap of misuse of social media, but then there's a lot of benefits too. So I I really do believe that it comes back to your personal relationship with God. And on the benefits side of thing, I'd love to hear what are some times where you've gotten like outside validation of this ministry was well-timed and successful in my life? Um, there was an instance where um, one of our readers just was struck with an illness that was really unexpected and she was bedridden and she wasn't able to participate in Christian community. And she hand wrote us the sweetest card that basically said, um, thank you so much for your ministry. Your articles have helped grow my faith. They've pointed me to the word. And in a time where I can't be in community with people, I feel like reading your magazine has um, helped me feel like I'm just sitting with another woman for coffee and just enjoying an edifying conversation. So um, I, yeah, I, when I talk about social media, sometimes I can get really passionate about its downfalls, but at the same time, deeply rooted it is in existence because of our social media community. We really have put no money into advertising. We've used Instagram. It's been such a blessing to us to be able to reach that people people that way. And it's helped also just make a lot form a lot of connections of um, like minded believers together. So that's just one instance I think that it really blessed me when I heard that. No, that's super encouraging. I mean it's a tool, right? Like various social medias have various pros and cons. And I think it's completely valid for believers for any number of personal reasons to go, you know what, I'm going to do no social media or I'm going to do no Facebook or no Twitter, no Instagram or whatever. But it is also a tool. It's a tool used by sinful folks for, for good and for ill. And if we're going to use it as believers, how are we going to use it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's, What's interesting is I've done the social media fast, too, and often what I've found is as I get off, I'm still having the same problems. They're just being magnified in different areas of my life, and it comes back to the fact that my heart's sinful, and I need Jesus. So um, we can throw our phone out the windows and and say we'll never hop on it again, but we'll find that vanity pops up still in other areas in different ways, and so um, it really comes back to the heart and just allowing God to deal with us in that way. No, for sure. So, I mean, you've mentioned the local church in your book and a couple of times here. What would you say that, um, how has the church benefited you in your role as a dreamer and somebody who's at least part of her ministry is trying to enable other folks to glorify God in this way? I would say that God has given us, obviously God has given us spiritual gifts, but he's given us a lot of passions and desires that um, can really benefit and build up the local church body. And if we're um, trying to pursue something, like obviously we can pursue careers and different things outside of the local church. But if we're not using those gifts within the church, then we're truly missing out on an awesome opportunity and experience um, to just be a part of the greater body. And so my desires for um, writing or photography, I've been able to use those in those settings. And it's been just 
such an immense blessing um, to see, man, something that doesn't, like, photography doesn't sound like a Christian thing, and yet my gift is able to contribute to my local church in an awesome way. So um, my encouragement to the Christian dreamer would be, like, definitely seek the Lord in what it is that you're trying to pursue, but be also seeking for ways that you can use it um, in the context of your your church body. It's hmm. good. And um, so let's say you've encountered someone who's a dreamer and they are motivated, they pursue their dream, they put a lot of energy and effort into it. And for whatever reason or another, that, that dream doesn't work out. Um, how do you... How do you continue to encourage that person to stay resilient, uh, stay fervent, and and continue to maintain um, that dream in their heart, even if they either have to pursue something else or or pursue it differently? I think our responses to those situations um, are often indicators of like how tightly we're holding on to those dreams. I think everything going on in the world right now um, with the pandemic and people losing jobs and um, we're just in a situation where there's a lot of people who have been forced to either press pause on a dream that they wanted to pursue um, or they've been just forced out of a dream because they've, they've lost their jobs. And so these are really uh, real situations and circumstances that people are facing right now. And I think at the end of the day, we have to just trust that um the Lord is in control. I talked about that earlier. Um, but the, the reality that he loves us so much, and it's not, it's not our achievements on this earth. It's not our accomplishments. It's not our works that give us any sort of merit before him. When we look to the gospel and we recognize that it is solely Jesus who um, earns us a right standing before God, that, that frees us from this need to perform or to keep up with some of the standards that we have for ourselves. And so it can be really disappointing to lose something that, that you've been um, working towards or accomplishing towards, but we can just rest in the fact that, that God loves us with or without that dream. And so um, for me personally, there have been times in my life where, like even with the magazine, when we started out, we were doing four issues per year. Um, two years into it, we, my husband and I just realized the pace that I'm working at and the season of life that we were in, it just wasn't working for us. And so we scaled back to two issues. And then another two years later, we scaled back to one issue. That felt like a failure to me. It felt like a bad business move. It felt like, like, are people, are we going to lose momentum? But the reality was that God was calling me out of it because I just needed to be there, be home for my kids. I needed to be um, focused on our local church needs and different things there. And um, there's just freedom in releasing that to God and recognizing that, hey, this is my, this might be what he's calling me to do now, but he could always reopen the door in the future for us to pick up that pace later, or he might have something better for me. So, um, again, I just, I feel like I'm on repeat when I always say this, but it comes down to trusting that the Lord's in control, trusting that he loves us, that um, there's nothing we can do to earn earn our favor or right standing with him. And so that's just freeing. And that's essentially the message of the book that I've written is if that does happen, um, we can just trust him, give those desires to him and recognize that he will, he knows the desires of our heart and he will either take, he will either change them or shift them or um, he might resurrect them later. Who knows? Yeah. I think that's good. What you mentioned there of, of making sure the person is focused on having some freedom freedom in Christ, having that Christian liberty uh, and, and that rest that is afforded to that individual um, by just trusting in the Lord. That's that's really good. Yeah. And I think along those lines, you, you're talking about like kind of that resiliency that comes from someone really being in a sense rooted in the Lord and having their own like, you know, identity found in him. And I think resiliency has been something that's obviously so necessary right now during the uh, pandemic and everything. It can be really easy uh, in the midst of the pandemic to only see the things that are walls or are kind of like obstacles to our dreams or to different things that we want to do or accomplish. But are there any like things in, in the midst of this time, if you've thought about dreams and dreamers what, that are actually like unique opportunities that are presented by this time, this really unique time really in, in our lives? 
Yeah, I've seen a lot of creativity just from people like they're being I don't know what it's like. Well, you, you guys, some of you live in Florida or do you all live in Florida? Florida has been a lot more chill than a lot of different states, but there's a lot of places where people were just locked down, um, not able to go out. And I've seen a lot of creativity in terms of like the content that they're producing. They're starting up podcasts. But hey, or relaunching. <laughs> 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 yeah, you guys are. But they're they're starting up like different ventures and things that were in their heart, and they were just too busy to notice it before. I think also there's just a lot of um, really getting back to basics and essentials, and thinking about wow, like my schedule was at this um, unbearable pace before, and now that I'm stuck at home, I really am figuring out what matters most to me and what I do want to pursue. So um, it it all hasn't been negative. I think God's shaken up a lot of things for good. Yeah, what's really interesting too about what you're saying there, like the, to have life slow down and to understand there's so many, and you talk about this in your book too, that that there are the dreams that we have and even just the fact of thinking of ourselves as dreamers is culturally tied. The way that our culture does work, the way that our culture uh, now is, is shut down. You mentioned like, you know, the millennial versus somebody during the Great Depression, right? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I wonder, as you were thinking about that, I was like, what role does history and cultural perspective do you think play in assessing our dreams? Oh, that's a good question. What's funny is that line about the Great Depression that I'd written, I thought about taking it out because I'm like, oh, maybe this is too far-fetched. And then the pandemic happened and I was like, oh, this is actually kind of perfect. But, but um, <laughs> I do... I do believe that, I mean, man, look at the news headlines today, how everything is so geared towards just the, the election that's, that's upcoming. Everything is uh, tied to our, our surroundings. And I think that's the cool thing about scripture is that it takes you out of your current context and it helps you recognize, like, look at, the, look at these people who are living in a totally different cultural context, but look at how God, God's truth impacts and affects them and how that can apply to you today. And so um, I do think that just current events and different life happenings really shapes the way that we pursue or press pause on things. I mean, we, we are living in the here and now, and there are a lot of people whose hands are forced in ways that they, they didn't imagine and they didn't expect that a global pandemic would happen. But um, yeah, does that, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Sometimes it, it takes some of those things to even shake up maybe habits in which we've read scripture kind of from our culture instead of from its culture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you even mentioned that, I think, somewhere towards the beginning of the book. Um, I just talk about reading scripture in context because a lot of times we can read our current situation. We're, we open the Bible looking for ourselves, but the reality is, is that, like, Paul's letters were written to a certain church at a certain time who were experiencing something you know, like First Peter is all about a church who was being persecuted and they were suffering. And so um, we just have to be cautious as we read through, be mindful as we read through scripture um, and how we apply it to ourselves. So I do spend some time talking about that. And um, I know it's a book about dreaming, but really, if scripture is at the heart of our dreaming, we have to be reading and interpreting it properly. Yeah, right. that whole uh, if God is for us kind of thing that is used really really poorly so often it was nice to see that you yeah. talked about that a little bit because i've i see that everywhere but like especially in the whole entrepreneurial world that i think has a lot of value a lot of people are doing good things there are a lot of christians who want to change the world for the better or like impact their communities for good via various projects or ventures or businesses or foundations like those are good things yeah. But we don't want to idolize ourselves, idolize our dreams. Like we don't want to lose the ability to self-reflect. Yeah. One thing I found really interesting too with that is in the scripture, a lot of times you find that there's the people who are kind of the opponents of the people of God are themselves, you know, readers of scripture and believers in scripture. 
And I know just a moment ago, you mentioned Paul and we were talking about like interpreting the text and that kind of stuff. And you mentioned Paul in your book. And I thought that was, um, you kind of go back and forth between Paul and Saul. And like, he kind of had a dream, right. Of like rounding up a whole bunch of believers into this, in this heretic in his mind, Jesus, the best Pharisee and do, yeah. And be just the best Pharisee possible. And obviously coming from his place in kind of dreaming, I guess, as he would, would have at the time saw it as based in scripture. How, how does someone kind of avoid pursuing a dream like a Pharisee? That's, that's a good question. Um, yeah, he, what's interesting to me is that he was so passionate and zealous about basically eradicating Christians that he missed out on the God of the true God of scripture who was sending up, sending down his Messiah at the time. And to me, his, his uh, life is so interesting because it was really God who chose at that time to put Jesus on his path when he was on the road to Damascus. And so, um, sorry, would you mind repeating your question again? Yeah, I guess the question then becomes like, how can we have our own innocence without needing glory to shine down on us kind of road to Damascus moment where we can correct maybe some of our incorrect uh, dream pursuits that might be fueled by false ideas of, of what the Bible's telling us to do. And that's where, yeah, it, cause there's times where we can be pursuing a dream and we can um, be so convinced that this is what God's will for us is, but then we can be completely off. And so I think that's where we constantly have to be walking in a spirit of humility and asking the Lord um, to just search our hearts, to make clear our intentions, to convict us. Um, I think seeking counsel from mentors, um, from pastors, like before I started Deeply Rooted, like I obviously talked to my husband, I sought counsel. And so there's, there's safeguards that we can put into place to help us navigate and discern whether or not we should pursue something. But um, sometimes we have to fall flat on our face and we have to experience a lot of closed doors just to realize, okay, maybe God's trying to redirect me. I think at the end of the day, what it comes down to is, do I want my will or do I want his will to be done? And that's a hard question to ask because sometimes the things that we want are truly good things. We could have a desire for a spouse, a desire for kids, a desire for promotion and um, have the best of intentions. And yet, um, do we want what God wants for us? What if he doesn't want us to have those things? And so there is a lot of self-reflection that happens with that and um, it can offer some hard answers. Yeah, and I think in, in, in that self-reflection, you find yourself needing to make sure that as you pursue those dreams, that you don't uh, pursue it in such a way where the simple things that God could call you to is abandoned. Because it's like, oh, I don't want to be a husband of my home. I want to change the world. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I think guarding your heart in that way is, is, is a good thing you mentioned there because it, it helps us not to dismiss the maybe the smaller things that God is calling us to. Yeah, and that's that's a good point. Even the even the words like I want to do a big thing for God or I don't want to do a small thing. We almost as Christians have to like re relook at what we define as success and failure because um when we know that we can do all things for the glory of God, it really changes the way that we do the unseen tasks. For me, being a mom, there's a lot that I do that like during the day with my kids, I don't get likes for that. I don't get follows for that. I don't (laughs) post about it, but the Lord sees me and I'm doing it as if I'm doing it for Jesus. I'm like, there's, there's value um, in a lot of the unseen things. So we we do have to shift our mindset um, and just really recognize that God is our audience of one. And um, I don't know, that's, that's a whole nother topic. (laughs) Yeah, there's not a lot of positive feedback loop in parenting <laughs> where yeah. the parents, the kids are rewarding you for doing a good job as a parent. Right. <laughs> yeah. It comes really late. So a lot of the material in the book and some of the conversation, I think rightly so, has been geared toward women because that's a lot of folks of your ministry. But I'm curious, what are your thoughts and what uh, counsel or encouragement would you give to the men in the audience as to how they can they can enable the women in their life to both keep the main thing, the main thing, keep the audience of one primary, but also to pursue those things in a godly manner. That's a great question. Um, I really believe when um, the husband is encouraging his wife in his, in her walk with God, and when he's holding her accountable, when you guys are having open conversations, praying together, um, just 
checking in on her heart. Like there's times where Ethan will just, my husband Ethan will just ask me like, hey, how are you doing? Like <laughs> to me, a hey, how are you doing is like just one of those things we casually throw out in America is like a question, but like he'll genuinely ask me like, hey, how have you been? And it's in those open conversations where we've had just it's been a great opportunity for me to share like what God's been teaching me, maybe some areas where I feel restless. And so um, maybe areas where I'm struggling, like I haven't been reading my Bible. Like, can you hold me accountable in that? And to me, it, the relationship with God, my personal relationship with God is where um, our, is when our marriage flourishes, when I'm, when I'm in my Bible, when I'm in prayer, when I have church community, all of those things contribute to my walk with God and the overflow of that, it benefits my marriage and the overflow of that benefits the things that I'm pursuing. It really shapes my perspective and my worldview and my perception of life. Um, and there's that, that funny saying, like, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> and sometimes that can be so true in marriage. Like the, the, the wife can be the, uh, the thermometer of the, the culture of the home, like, or the temperature of the home. Um, and so just, I don't know, just checking in on her heart is so helpful, taking that time to have those conversations, encouraging her, words of affirmation, um, and making sure that, like, she's just, I don't know, doing well in her walk with God. And when she's not, not, like, just helping come alongside her, send her an encouraging verse as a text message, or just, just be an active spiritual leader in her life. And I think everything else falls into place, and that includes the way that she pursues her dreams, because when... Um, she has a husband who's supporting her and loving her. She's able to um, recognize her spiritual gifts, step up where she needs to, step down when she needs to. And so um, it just, to me, it always comes back to the, the walk with God. That's excellent. So you've successfully founded a magazine that's going on, and now you've written your first book. And yes, dreams are in the small things and the everyday faithfulness in life, but um, is there, you know, new things on the horizon for you or, or what are, what are some of the things that maybe are nascent dreams for you? I, so right before, um, all this COVID stuff happened, my husband and I were actually looking around for some commercial spaces. Cause one dream of mine would be to have like deeply rooted, have a physical space, um, where it could be like a modern Christian bookstore slash coffee shop. So we were looking around and we prayed about it and just didn't feel at peace. And then Corona happened, businesses were shut down, like major businesses are filing bankruptcy and moving to just online models and closing their brick and mortar stores. So it's just interesting looking back to so that. To me, having a brick and mortar shop is a dream of mine, but I just, I don't know that that's what the Lord wants for us. And so um, this is a, this is a weird season for me because we just launched our uh, 15th issue of the magazine. And yeah, the book launched in March. And so Ethan and I have both decided we're like, okay, for the rest of the year, I'm not starting anything new. I just, I'm going to spend <laughs> time on prayer, spend time seeking the Lord and really just seeking what does it look like for now that he's in local church ministry? What does it look like? What does our schedule look like? Um, what does it look like for us to be a family in this? And so I'm not sure. That's my answer. Is I'm not sure. I have a lot of dreams, but I don't, I don't know. I'm just waiting on the sure. Lord. Well, I mean, when things kind of equalize a little bit, you might, you guys will probably be able to find some great deals on commercials. <laughs> 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 uh, so I, we got a couple questions at the end that we want to hit, but I'm also curious. I mean, college ministry was a very important part of our spiritual formation. And I mean, kind of like when you're out on your own a little bit more and forming your own identity, like what are his and your plans as far as a uh, college ministry on. And especially now too, with, I don't know, are you guys all um, digital? Um, thankfully we're able to do local, like we're, we're actually this Saturday is our big kickoff. Um, and then we'll start regular Tuesday nights. Our church has opened their doors and we're trying to practice social distancing and do all of those things. But um, I think the big heartbeat for college ministry with especially my husband, Ethan, he, even though he was in the military, he was pursuing his bachelor's and then his master's degree. And he came face to face with a college professor who just flat out started the class and said, if any of you talk about Jesus, like I'm going to fail you basically. And so he engaged with him in conversations where um, the guy, he, he talked, why are you so against Jesus? And he was basically like, no one can give me any answers. And so a lot of the questions that he had, 
Ethan couldn't answer, but that's what formed his love for apologetics, which is defending the faith. And so he came back to his professor by the end of the semester, um, kind of de debated, talked with him, and the professor was like, you're the first person to actually give me solid answers that aren't just have faith. And so that's kind of our, our heart for college ministry is we want to be able to um, help shape their worldview, point them back to scripture, give them answers, and help them to be able to defend their faith as they are on the Christian campuses, especially um, the ones at secular schools, but they, to know why they believe what they believe um, going off of First uh, Peter 3.15. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. college, that is when, especially if you leave where you grew up and you go to college out of town. But even if like, I went to Clearwater, I grew up in Florida and I went to Clearwater. I lived in Clearwater, Dunedin, Palm Harbor. Like I was always in that general area. But even then like college is kind of where you in our country begin to become your own person. That whole saying of like, God doesn't have any grandchildren. Like you're not, you're not in because of your parents. You're not in because of your community. Like you kind of begin to decide in our culture, like, is my faith mine? Is it my parents? Do I believe it? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, I just want to be encouraging you guys. Like that's that's a really awesome and valuable ministry. Both like you said, equipping folks apologetically to both understand their faith and defend it, but also not in a pick and fights kind of way, which yeah. young, young folks <laughs> do tend to like to do once they finally right. understand their faith for the first time. But also just like, develop that community you talked in the book in here about how important like the fellowship of the saints is and i mean in college you're not married you don't have kids you probably don't have tons of demands at your job and you're able to so invest in the community of faith and like when you're in college it's it's such a rich time so i'm excited for you guys thank you yeah we're excited too you know in this time you're talking about you know, having time to just kind of sit and reflect. Is there anything awesome that you're reading? That was going to be one of my next questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That you wanted to share. Um, I just finished a book by Elizabeth Elliot called Be Still My Soul. And it was just a really easy to read book and yet very deep and, and impactful. I A lot of times I tend to read like old dead theologians that are, and they all happen to be men. And so it's very refreshing to we, to read a woman writer who um, has the depth that is able to apply it to like, just your uh, keeping your home and being a wife and all of those things. So um, I've, I'm kind of on an Elizabeth Elliot binge right now. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I was going to ask it books, books, podcasts, stuff like that. Where, where have you been finding edification and enjoyment? Um, I, yeah, I love reading books. Um, one of my favorite books is The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. Um, I really like Treasuring Christ When Your Hands Are Full by Gloria Furman. That's, an, that's an, a modern author. Um, podcast, I've been listening to um, Allie Beth Stuckey, Relatable. I don't know if you've heard of her at all. She I'm writes not. on a lot of, a lot of like, or she talks about a lot of um, cultural hot topics and how that, um, how Christianity, like, plays into those different things so nice. yeah yeah okay. yeah no I, I we're always out on the lookout for that and i mean we want to divide the word as properly as we can but we have also noticed a just a gap in the podcast space for shows and content that both takes the bible seriously and also kind of takes culture seriously not elevating it over the word or anything but somewhere between hot takes off the top of your head and like verse by verse preaching on a podcast, like something that engages both the mind and the heart and is practical and stuff that you can kind of hopefully share with anybody. Yeah, that sounds good. Let me know when you find one that's just like that. <laughs> kind of just my final question on book content. As I was reading your book, my heart just kept getting pulled for whatever reason to you know, the people who are stuck in hard places, whether that be the single person who is longing for to find that relationship and is struggling with loneliness, or even somebody who's struggling, I mean, in these times, economic for oppression, sure, yeah. social oppression, racial oppression, and are, you know, dreaming good things for themselves, but just find those dreams thwarted 
by whether it be evil or just circumstances, what encouragements would you offer to someone in a situation like that? Um, one of my favorite verses is 2 Corinthians twelve nine, which says, My grace is sufficient for you, but my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest in me. Um, I, I like the verse so much because it just admits that we can be in a state where we just feel weak, where we feel down and out. Um, we just feel tired and weary. Um, but the recognition that Jesus <laughs> offers us his strength that we don't have to carry it all on our own, that he, um, his grace is sufficient for us, that he, he's enough for us. And so as we're, um, trying to move forward in a pursuit or we, we just feel stuck, like we can't move forward. We can just rest in the fact that God supplies us with everything that we need in Christ Jesus. And so um, we can still bear fruit in very difficult seasons. We can still have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, all of the things um, that can feel like, like we, when we're stuck, it can feel like, how can I have joy? How can I have um, patience in, in these times? And yet, the Holy Spirit is more than capable of, of bearing fruit in us if we're abiding in Jesus. And so just cling cling to the scriptures and read the Psalms. The Psalms are such great, great places to recognize that people in scripture like went through really hard things and we can easily read, oh, here's where they came out of it. But what about in that in between? The Psalms are such a good place to see really real emotions met with the truth of God, those two things intersecting together. Yes, very. That's that's great. Great wisdom right there. Well, I, I was thinking about asking another question. That was that's a really good way to. Uh, I was going to ask a question that was not as uh, not as substantive. We'll say is <laughs> that one um, like what makeup brand or? Yeah. I, <laughs> um, I lose my train of thought. There. Yeah, gotcha. So uh, yeah. wrapping up here, Diane. Uh, I, I know we've talked about the book and the magazine. Where can folks find you? Where can they find the book? Where can they find the magazine? Yeah, the, uh, the book is wherever books are sold, and thankfully Amazon is open, so <laughs> you can buy books on Amazon now. It's called A Holy Pursuit, and the magazine you can find at deeplyrootedmag.com. Excellent. And uh, is it Janae over at uh, Lifeway? Yeah, Janae is my publicist. She's wonderful. Yeah, Janae was nice enough to give us a couple of copies to give away, so uh, listeners look out for... We're going to do some promotions on that for a giveaway. So we have two copies, two hard copies of the book that we'll be giving away um, after the show drops. That's awesome. Check the socials. Thanks for thanks for coming on and for just your passion uh, for the Lord and for Christian women and just the deep things that matter in life. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'm just appreciative of you guys um, putting together a podcast that is just Christ-centered, God-honoring, and yet super relevant to a lot of the topics of our culture. So keep pressing on. Will do. And it was nice to actually speak with you again. I've been following, I'm like, every now and then I'll see me like, oh, like, Diane, she's doing this, you're doing that. So it's nice to uh, speak with you again. I super duper wish you guys luck and am very excited to hear about... Um, college ministry and just the pursuits and things going forward thank you so much so good to connect with you again too thanks for joining us we'll see you later all right well we hope you guys enjoyed that um that was diane jago that was an excellent conversation and like i said you can look for a contest in the coming week or so giving away two copies of those books thanks again to lifeway for that and you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Substance Pod. Um, like the show, comment, share it, and uh, feel free to give us some feedback. We love to. He- we always love to hear what you guys have to say, and um, looking forward to interacting with you there as well. If you guys have thoughts or interaction with any of the ideas we covered with Diane today or just on the subjects of dreams, what are some of the things that you know, you've, you've dreamt about or that you are pursuing but maybe have struggled with, um, you can leave a message on our phone line at 913-703-3883 or you could also write us an email at thesubstancepod at gmail.com.
And if you are wondering how to support us um, here at the Substance Podcast, um, there are three primary ways to do that. One is subscribing to the podcast. Uh, next is give us a five star rating, especially if you enjoy the content. And, and even though it's not the best podcast platform, Apple's super influential. So just tell anybody with an iPhone, be like, hey, go to go to Apple Podcasts, give the substance five stars. Just, just Here, drop that link. Yeah. Do it. Just just have your airdrop on and it'll drop to anybody. Airdrop it. Has it on. Airdrop, airdrop it to, to your all. dog. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, that's gonna become a thing. I don't know about that. <laughs> and if you would like to bless us financially, we do have a cash app. And that as that is at dollar sign the substance pod. Thanks for tuning in. And don't forget no, forget that part. Do forget. <laughs> Do forget. <laughs> Try cut line. Let's see how Trevor edits this nonsense. <laughs>